to welcome everyone to today's discussion uh, focused on Mer how Mercy has implemented a gig nursing model, a platform to support scheduling and implementation, and in turn has reduced their reliance on agency nurses. My name is Sharon Alexander, and I am the Director of Workforce Initiatives here at the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association. And this conversation is in follow-up to a webinar that some of you participated in earlier this year, and I hope will be an opportunity to ask your questions about implementation and considerations. I know here in Virginia, we are also thinking creatively and exploring different staffing models to address uh, some of the workforce challenges and the desire to move more towards flexible staffing models. As, and you will notice that you're all muted, um, but we hope this will be an engaging conversation and hope you will ask questions either as prompted by raising your hand or in the chat box, uh, and I will facilitate those uh, to our speaker. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to our speaker for today, Nita Al-Ramahi, who is presenting on behalf of Mercy, and Dr. Betty Jo Roshio. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here today. So just as a brief um, introduction about myself, I am the Executive Director of Operations for our health system. We have a coverage area across four states, over 45 inpatient hospitals um, in, in the Midwestern region. And this is primarily focused on how did we translate the strategy into sustainable um, operations on a day-to-day -day basis. We had quite remarkable outcomes in this, but really the primary focus is how did we leverage the strategy and transform that and translate that in sustainable operations using enabling technologies to do so. And I see that Dr. Betty Jo Rocchio has joined us here. So Betty Jo, if you'd like to um, introduce yourself as this is the uh, uh, introduction to the presentation. Hey guys, I so apologize. I am um, speaking at a national summit this week and my flight was a little bit delayed. So I am in an airport, but we are gonna get this done for sure. So um, I am Betty Jo Rocchio. I am the Senior Vice President and Chief Nursing Executive of Mercy. Um, health system. Nita and I collaborate and work together on um, everything for um, workforce design as well as work environment and workflows. So we're going to talk a little bit today. I think your request was to talk about the gig nursing workforce and we are going to um, give you a great introduction for how this was formulated. We want to leave about a half hour for questions so we're interested in hearing uh, what you're most interested in. Uh, but this workforce layer has really um, taken us very quickly to uh, recruiting and retention, as well as increasing headcount and FTEs in Mercy. So excited to present this to you today. Um, and one of the things as we kicked, kick it off is it is based in evidence-based practice. Um, it isn't something that we dreamed up, but we use the literature to be able to form our um, opinion on what direction to move. So. Um, you'll notice that it's strategically placed here that it's the Mercy, Mercy Workforce vision. Um, and what I will say is it goes clear from vision to strategy to execution. And you're going to be able to see all those layers today. Um, and I would argue that the future is now, meaning that um, it's time to pivot our workforce design and our work environment design um, to design for what we have available to us and increase the joy in nursing practice. So uh, you're going to hear a little bit. Uh, throughout. I'm going to talk a little bit about background um, and then I am going to be quiet and let Nita talk a little bit about the technology and analytics because she really powers that lane for us. Um, she's everything nursing operations and I count on her uh, vision and strategy. She is not a nurse. Um, she is really our operational person and our operational thinking behind this. So, all right, Nita, next slide. I did want to introduce a little bit about Mercy, and the only reason I put this in here, guys, is because I want you to see um, both um, our spans, how large we are, and that system thinking that went across all of Mercy. So what you're going to hear about today isn't in one or two of our hospitals. It's in all 40 of our acute care hospitals, as well as some of our specialty hospitals. So you're going to see a design that is really system thinking 
macro level devel development um, and technology and analytics powering this across the health system. Um, you can read a little bit about Mercy. We will also share the deck with you if you um, want it after this call. Um, but we do, um, every single one of our hospitals participates on this and it is a large scale workforce initiative. All right, let us um, dive into the why. So um, it's important as nursing leaders that we set the strategy that's grounded in evidence. And you'll see we started a paper and this, this genesis of this paper is published in the January edition of Nursing Administration Quarterly. Um, we think it's important to publish our work, um, how we got to where we are, and then talk a little bit um, about um, the program development, the technology, and then the results are most important. So you can see where we've been. This work started way before COVID. So we realized that the nursing workforce was changing and no longer are our nurses and clinical coworkers gonna fall in line with what we need, but what they're really gonna want is something that meets their personal needs. So designing in that win-win mentality is very, very important to building a strong and healthy workforce. And so I'm not gonna read this literature to you, but you can see all the literature points to, we are not gonna have enough nurses, we are not gonna be able to deliver care the way we did today, and forcing that care delivery model and the workforce to accommodate our needs is likely gonna drive them away from our health system. So trying to figure out what the literature is telling us and design a strategy that accomplishes what our coworkers need and what we need um, to take care of our patients. Next slide. All right, no secret to any of you. If there's anybody on here that says, I have no idea what you're talking about, that nursing um, profession is facing a major crisis, you probably don't read much uh, or have been too busy in uh, operations to, to figure it out. But Here's the predictions on what's coming our way. Now, it depends on a lot of things. We know that nursing school is about a four-year cycle. So uh, some of these statistics were based on that, um, not understanding that some of our nursing schools um, are gonna be developed and we have new nursing schools springing up. But we're thinking there's gonna be about a 3.2 million shortfall supply for healthcare workers by 2026. That means from today, three years off, we're already predicting shortages. We also feel like we know that there's a 25% increase in turnover for nursing roles. In fact, I just saw the new NSI study that came out in the last couple of months, and that's exactly what it, it has, is that our turnover rate nationally is somewhere between 20 to 25%, and that further exacerbates our problem. So. Um, the movement, even if they stay in the profession of nursing, by the way, it's Betty Jo Rocchio's opinion that people aren't leaving nursing, they're leaving the jobs in nursing that don't fit their lifestyles, and that if we design a better healthcare model, um, that nursing's going to have to participate in, in what that might look like. Um, you might know, but we are shifting to more hospital at home, we're shifting to more outpatient procedures, um, and this is good news for nursing because nurses are shifting into more of those outpatient environments, less of the 24 by seven bed, uh, bedside coverage. So this actually is gonna probably help us a little bit if we design our healthcare delivery models after where we're moving in healthcare overall, but still not gonna prevent the turnover. Next slide. There is a, a mental health crisis going on today across our nation, and it's not just in nursing. It's not just in nursing, but it is literally for all of us in healthcare. So we're gonna have to design what that might look like to better prepare us. Next slide. Uh, this is just a, um, just, um, I'm gonna go off a of camera here, guys, but this is just a little bit about the new um, talent, what they're looking for to retain and um, be able to serve our coworkers. So, Nita, next slide. Next, I want to talk a little bit about the what. Um, and you can see from our evidence-based practice synthesis table, there are five lanes here that we've really taken a look at. 
And technology is at the top of the list. We believe that we're not going to be able to deliver a workforce experience without technology fueling it. I think we're going to have to develop a new vision for the nursing career based off the evidence. Flexibility is going to be key, as well as work-life balance and control over people's personal lives and work lives. We're seeing less of a split between professional and personal lives because people don't split their lives. Um, they are one person trying to execute on a strategy for both their personal and professional lives. There is a ton of literature here, which we will provide references for at the end, uh, but did want to talk a little bit about that. Next slide, Nita. Nita, I'm going to let you take over. I'm moving into a car, and I'm going to let you talk a little bit about our workforce layers um, and what the vision is behind executing the gig nursing strategy. Okay, absolutely happy to do so. So this is really the, the foundational piece around our strategic thinking around how do we balance our workforce layers. Rather than losing our workforce to other areas based off of their lifestyle needs, we like to think that, hey, we are the, the ultimate hub of you to be able to work with us at any stage, at any point in life, um, in, in your careers or in your lifetime. And so for us, that consists of these three main layers, and that is our core coworkers, which is often facility-based, more of your traditional roles, people who enjoy and desire that level of stability um, from a full-time, part-time, PRN unit-based roles. And then we have something called the flex layer, and that's really focused on that, that flexibility, that desire to have flexibility and control over one schedule, depending on whatever uh, stage of life they're at. And so that for us is our regional and local float pools, are, um, and they could either be full-time, part-time, or it's that gig per diem role around minimal requirements, but still enabling somebody to, to practice and also contribute to organizational fill rate. And then agencies at the very top, and we don't believe that agency will completely 100% be dissolved, but it should be at the very top layer, the minimal um, aspect of, of our workforce layers. And so when you look at this at a whole, right, we wanna have the majority of, of uh, our workforce layer to be a combination of our core coworkers, and our flex coworkers, and really keeping that agency layer very, very minimal. And how do we do this? We do this by leveraging technology to allow us to balance, you know, the the, the different number of uh, of coworkers within these workforce layers. And so, what we've seen through our implementation and through this this process is quite a bit of um, outstanding um, results in not only retention but improved fill rate. For us. And so um, how did we do this? So that gig per diem role that I was just referencing is uh, not a typical traditional nursing role. It is a nurse who is interested in working um, whenever they desire. There is no benefits to this role. Um, so they are a zero FTE co-worker. Um, we do require that they work one shift every 30 days um, for us. And that's recently changed. Um, but it's really um, allowing them to dictate their schedule um, and then whatever preferences. And we do this through an app. So we have this fully integrated in our system for staffing and scheduling. And in real time, it shows all of our openings of shifts. It could be a combination of four hour shifts, six, eight and 12 hour shifts um, that would be populated into the app. And our gig coworkers are treated just like any other Mercy coworker. Um, in the sense that we educate them, we uh, provide that preceptorship, we ensure that they have all the certifications and qualifications to work within our facilities like any other nurse. But again, they have that flexibility in terms of work requirements and can self-select um, based off of the pool of openings that we need. What's very important about um, uh, the, the method in which we enable this is really that integration with the system for staffing and scheduling and identifying where those gaps are, where are hard to fill, um, shifts are and really creating that level of visibility for these types of coworkers to 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 pick up and supplement to our fill rate. So, in terms of uh, the the common theme around the technology, the technology is that we have integration, fully integrated systems with our staffing and scheduling system, our way to manage nursing uh, credentialing and to ensure nursing education is current and up to date, 
but also to create an easy user experience and being able to immediately and quickly see what shifts uh, are available for that coworker within that particular geography um, and then have them pick up. And the way that it's so seamless is that the, the, the parameters are set into that staffing and scheduling system. A coworker picks up a shift within the mobile app and then that gets updated automatically in real time back into your system for staffing and scheduling. So there's a level of visibility, not only from the coworker perspective, but all of your nursing leaders um, within your facility. So that way they can routinely adjust and rebalance their schedules from a deployment perspective. So this is the enabler for the success of that, that strategy. So our app is called Mercy Works On Demand. And this is a, once again, a mobile uh, application that you can download from the, the Google store or to the apps store. But again, it being seamlessly integrated and connected into our system for staffing and scheduling um, makes it very easy to visualize that into that application, have those coworkers, both not only our gig coworkers, but our internal coworkers to pick up incentive shifts via this central source of truth um, for us. And so um, we have seen, again, that, that benefit of maximizing, you know, uh, where uh, a coworker chooses to work, but also leveraging um, to our fill rate. So this is what it looks like at a very high level. Um, it's a very simple um, uh, user interface, and there is a, an opportunity to filter down on uh, coworker preferences. I only wanna work Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, or I only wanna pick up a shift on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, this technology enables one to do so, um, to, to, to really um, not only uh, adhere to the preferences of the coworker, but also target to uh, meet fill rate uh, of all of our unmet staffing needs. So this just again walks through how it works um, and it's really to remove the guesswork out of how we traditionally deploy staff, how we fill our units and it's to automate that. It's to remove the burden off of the frontline leader to say, well, okay, where do I, who do I need and when do I need somebody um, and really have removed that level of um, burden off of that frontline leader in a very seamless way. So the integrated technology that begins in our staffing and scheduling system will show and model and be visualized into that Mercy Works On Demand app around your needs versus have, which is, which is equating to our fill rate at the unit level. And then what it also does from a facility level is rebalances it out and creates that level of visibility for your deployment offices or for your staffing offices. So that way when you're engaging in that operational life cycle, it's very seamless. There's visibility into what your staffing levels are at all times and how it continuously changes in real times as people pick up shifts. Um, but also then the price, um, the price of the incentive shift based off of supply and demand is much more automated. And so that removes the the one-to-one um, -one verbal agreements that we traditionally have up at the front line and really automates that based off of need and placing and equating a weight, a financial weight, associated to your critical staffing areas. Okay. So I'm not going to um, uh, really go into this slide because I think it's a regurgitation of what I just described, but the key piece here is that in order to get to this place, you need to align your strategy, your staffing and scheduling operations structure, and ensure that there's technical readiness to adapt into something like that. And that is a key thing in the integration of operationalizing something like this, but also it's sustainability and engagement of, of where you're at. And so let's talk a little bit about results because I, I really enjoy speaking about this. Um, but this is really focused around, you know, when we have a, a better work environment, a steady workforce, we know that our coworkers are happier, right? And we see that positive trend into that. And so from a financial perspective from that gig coworker, um, we have had over uh, 5,000 gig applicants uh, and it continues to trend up. That's a positive trend for us. And the conversion of gig, gig applicants to hire is somewhat relative and it varies by region to region. We have four regions across our health system, uh, anywhere from 62 to 35% of qualified applicants. And that's a very positive trend for us. And so we currently have um, about 1,500 gig hires 
um, as of as of May. And we know that um, a large majority of that are rehires into our health system, or they're either transfers um, within our organization, um, and then 29% of uh, truly new hires that never worked at Mercy uh, ever, and we were able to attract them based off of this, this flexible layer. In conjunction with that, what we've seen since we've implemented this is our fill rate has improved by 4%. So we have a target, we have achieved our fill rate of 90%. We know in the literature anywhere from 80 to 85%, that's a, a comfortable place to be in terms of um, uh, clinical quality outcomes, but also comfortable care delivery workload. Um, and so we, we see it consistently at 91%. Our labor per equivalent patient day, which is essentially is our cost to deliver ca uh, patient care, has decreased by 15%. Our average hourly rate by workforce layer, which is our cost of each resource, has decreased by 15%. Our agency spend has decreased by 63% uh, as replaced by our flexible workforce layer and our in, uh, improvements in um, retention. And our RRN and LPN turnover decreased by 11%. And our unlicensed personnel, which is our patient care techs, turnover has decreased by 8%. So for us, that's pretty astronomical uh, in terms of where we have started. Um, and, and we're seeing um, agency costs um, you know, when we talk about it being decreased by 63%, that equates to about $15 million. And so that is substantial for us from an organizational perspective. So the, the future of our workforce is dynamic. And so we've enabled a very dynamic technological um, uh, enabler of this. And it needs to be dynamic, and that's exactly what we've turned on. So in addition to having this app, we're, we're engined by um, AI, and it dictates and it is able to see some trends um, over time and really refine the rates for um, in incentive shift pickup while not impacting our fill rate as we see it continuously um, increase. And so that is the key piece, the lessons learned that we have um, uh, seen to date is is having clear strategy and vision on where we need to be, reimagining and reorganizing our operational structures, especially when it comes to staffing and scheduling, and ensuring that our technology that we have selected is in alignment with that. That it's an enabler. Technology is not going to solve your workforce problems. It's doing that operational work on the up onset and then ensuring that there is a consistent and reliable way to not only have visibility into your workforce layers, but then to make it actual and to be able to, in real time, adjust the balance and leverage your different workforce layers as you need it to deliver your patient care. And so that is that is the, the key lessons learned. I am going to pause here because I know I've gone through quite a bit of content. I uh, want to leave opportunity and time to answer any questions that you, you may have about what was shared with you today. So, Nita, I'm just going to, I'm going to put a little bow on this from a nursing perspective. Um, I don't believe our workforce layers are going to become less complex. I believe they are as our healthcare delivery model changes, I think we're gonna to have to be able to flex our workforce models. And the only way to do it in a cost-effective, efficient manner is going to be using some amount of technology to take the burden off of our managers. They cannot possibly keep up with a flexible workforce model without some assistance. There's just, there's no way to do it. And if they can keep up, their burden is certainly gonna be expressed also in a higher cost of labor. So. We're trying to figure this out in a way that's not unlike Uber and Lyft. If you're looking at the correlation here, um, it's really designing a workforce model where people want to work. There are some flexibility in it. We're trading off those that want the comfort of a schedule versus what they might want to be paid to work that schedule. Um, and we saw that happen during the pandemic. And so we're trying to mimic a little bit of the workforce trends that we see, but but you can't just add in a gig, gig nursing layer. And you said it perfectly, Nita. It's got to be designed within your workforce strategy. So as the workforce moves, you can flex your strategy and you have the data to be able to see where to move your workforce. Um, 
And so I'm, I'm pretty passionate about making sure that the vision, the strategy, and then the execution layer lines up. Uh, because we have one of the most complex workforce layer models in nursing. So um, I do want to leave those thoughts with you. It's a lot of information, um, but there is something to be said for automating a flexible workforce layer. So, Nita, you can probably see the chat. I don't know if anybody has any specific questions, but uh, see one question you can that see just the came in. Left in hey, go ahead. The question is, are you experiencing any issues with RNs maintaining competency or difficulties in managing quality and or safe practice? No, and I'll tell you why. That's a really good comment. No, because we hire them in. They are still mercy nurses. So they go through the same uh, orientation, but they have to have experience. So it's less of an orientation. And we design our orientation model around a flexible schedule so people can get the same orientation they are functioning within the same competencies um, and they have immediate things available to them to help them while they're on the job to make sure that they have like our CLABSI bundles our CAUTI bundles and so we've designed the standardization um, around this workforce model so no actually we're seeing a higher quality our quality scores are going up our patient experience scores are going up and our coworker engagement scores are going up. So they are hired into a zero FTE, but they are mercy nurses. So they have the same expectations. Just to follow up on that. So with the orientation, um, are you all having one orientation that's for gig nurses or are you just putting them into your regular orientation? How are you integrating them into that person process? We have, yeah, we have a subset that's primarily focused on um, gig. And so um, it is more designed because typically the gig coworkers that we're hiring are experienced nurses. Um, and so uh, that's the wide majority of it. And so we don't want to regurgitate everything that they already know. It's a refresher to ensure that they are operating to our clinical standards. And so we do offer a subset curriculum specifically for our gig coworkers and have it fully automated in that process when they do join Mercy as a gig coworker. Next question is, are you anticipating adding a virtual nursing strategy into your layers of workforce? Uh, we actually already have that. Um, it's, we don't call it out separate, but we have a whole virtual, we have a whole virtual nursing strategy. We have a whole virtual hospital. So, We've got a whole subset of the population for both physicians and nurses, um, and we're delivering um, that strategy um, in every single workforce layer. You could be a gig virtual nurse, or you could be an ICU virtual nurse, a med surge virtual nurse. So it's interspersed between the workforce layers. Great. Uh, what is the experience threshold, or does that differ based on specialty? Yeah, so we have a very close relationship with our clinical education team and it is standardized. And so we do um, have targeted um, education or competencies that uh, from the onboarding process that we require of our gig coworkers. And it does differ based off of uh, specialty. We have certain things that we look for from a competency perspective. They're an ED nurse, a med surgery nurse, an ICU nurse. And we do look at and require some uh, certifications depending on those different settings. And so that is all mapped out. There are different pathways uh, when we go um, into the gig end-to-end -end, um, onboarding process, and they will fit into a pathway depending on their specialty. Hey, Nita, talk a little bit about where we keep those competencies, because I think it's important that they understand Mercy Works On Demand is the total strategy or warehouse for nursing. Um, because it's hard to understand how that app can look into a staffing and scheduling system and then bounce up against the eligible people. I don't, you might have said it and I might have been transitioning from the yeah. car. Yep. Yeah. In our onboarding process, and that's the power of the technology that we use, is that it is the central source of truth for us. And what we have from strategy perspective, we've implemented that those layers from a technology perspective. And so when we talk about those pathways, we create their allow units in the, so once they're onboarded, they're categorized in their pathway, and that cascades down into Mercy Works On Demand. 
So people only see the eligible shifts based off of their qualifications. And so a, uh, a med surge nurse is not going to see ICU uh, uh, shifts within the application based off of what is in their profile and their qualifications. And so that's a seamless automated connection. It removes the guesswork out of that. So we can 100% of the time say we have objectively all the qualified nurses seeing the, the, the shifts that they qualified for. We wouldn't have anybody in the system pick up a shift that they're not qualified for based off of their, their credentials and their experiences that's embedded into their profiles. And again, that's automated. It's nothing that the coworker can input or control or change, um, nor can the um, actual managing leader change. And so that goes through the formal changes. And so when they have competent annual uh, competency reviews, those discussions will be had and embedded in the uh, integrated uh, technology from an HR perspective. Of those that are um, seeking out the gig positions, what's their makeup? And that might have been in your slides, but what's the demographic that are seeking out gig positions? So the majority of our, uh, our applicants are, no, well, I did hear momentarily, are um, our, our rehires. And so that means they uh, were part of Mercy and they left Mercy and they came back to us. And so that is substantially the, the large majority of folks who've come to us. And that really proves our hypothesis around, hey, if we create this flexible workforce layer, it's going to meet them at the, 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 the stage of life in which that they're at. Uh, the other large bulk of people coming to us are transfers. And so they are uh, potentially core coworkers who need to change, need a change of pace, but don't want to stop working. And maybe that life has, uh, their, their life circumstances have changed and they've, they've transferred on um, to us uh, into a gig role and did not leave us. And then the other bulk of uh, coworkers who become gig are new hires. Since they have never worked with Mercy before, they've seen something, they've attracted them, largely are agency nurses who have chosen to settle down in a given geography and um, join uh, this, this gig workforce. Hey guys, also happy to have the nurse that works across the street, that works full time there that picks up extra hours with us rather than picking it up at their home hospital. That's an important point about gig nursing. It's a collection. It's not how many hours each coworker is working. It's literally about the combined effort to increase spill rate, right? More hands at the bedside, um, regardless of how you get it, is really the working theory behind this flexible layer. So it, it was kind of hard, I'll be honest, for our nursing leaders to get their heads wrapped around that. The change management on this was huge. Uh, because they were used to filling out a schedule, either having or not having what they need and then begging people to work. This is a totally different strategy. This says you can count on this percentage coming from the flexible workforce layer every single schedule. So put out your schedule for six weeks and know that they will come. And we've had that, Meet has had a hard burden of proving that through data to be able to change the hearts and minds of our leaders. So. Uh, Need has bared the brunt on all that through analytics, but um, everybody's fully engaged at this point um, and loves this layer. And is this a own tool or is this something you will work with another um, vendor on um, to create the app and the, the integration and the technology pieces? Go ahead, Nita. You can, you, I'm in a car, you'll do a much better job, but Talk about our idea, our workforce layer, and how you really reached out and partnered to make this come to life. Yep, we did part with uh, an external um, startup company um, to develop something like this. Um, we knew that this was a top priority and we keep hearing about, wow, I really need flexibility, especially coming out of the, the pandemic. And we also knew that fill rate you know, we really struggled in getting uh, the, the, the right types of people at the right time to ensure that we have consistent care delivery across the board. It's not like you can generate uh, more nurses to, to improve your core. And so how can we get those people in there? So we did quite a bit of work. We started off um, doing a proof of concept in one of our large facilities out in, in Springfield, did um, a lot of fast, quick learnings. And then um, a month later expanded um, health system wide across all of our uh, facilities, 40 hospitals. 
And so in that, we were able to um, uh, not only generate the quick learnings and adapt them, but configure the system in the way that we needed to work based off of how we deploy staffing and scheduling from an operations perspective. And so it is very much, it was a um, iterative um, cycle, but the good news is that the, the foundation is, is integration with your system for staffing and scheduling and ensuring that your operational practices are consistent across the board. Um, if it's one facility or multiple facilities that are engaging in something like this, um, and then uh, continuously iterating. And so as you know, your workforce is never the same, it's always changing. And the great, um, the great thing about the technology and the partner that we have um, is that we're, we adjust things, we tweak things as things are consistently changing. So that way we remain directionally accurate, which, which has been a, a proven success for us. But yes, we did, we did co-develop this. Can you talk a little bit, they may be wondering out there what our internal coworkers, the pickup incentive shifts, think about gig coworkers coming in. Talk a little bit about how smart the design was to use the technology for internal incentive shifts and the gig nursing workforce, how the technology is powering both and the order in which the shifts launch. I think that's yeah. important for our nursing. It is a very, yeah, it's a very important call out. And the strategy around here is, we know that there are multiple ways in which we can get our coworkers to work. And so it's, again, removing that, that burden off of the frontline leader who has to do a million different things and really centralize it to one point in which you can pick up incentive shifts. That has been across the nation, right? The, the, the lifesaver for many facilities in getting um, coworkers where you need to be in, in places of uh, critical staffing levels. And so, um, in our strategy, we eliminated multiple ways in which you can get incentive shifts. We embedded our internal coworkers in, in leveraging the Mercy Works on Demand. So it's a tool not only for our external workforce, but our internal workforce, not only in nursing, but our ancillary services as well, and our support services who routinely pick up their incentive shifts in this way. So there's no programs, there's no verbal agreements. It's an automated and clean and consistent way that drives people, our coworkers, to the areas of greatest need. And it gives that level of visibility and consistency and that data-driven decision-making to our frontline leaders to say, hey, all right, you want a high dollar amount, then that more often than not is gonna be in the areas where we have critical staffing, where, where, where our fill rate is really truly struggling. And that's the, the whole um, goal of all of this is how can we ensure that we have the appropriate people to take care of our patients consistently. And so if, um, and, and, and how do we align the, the way that we incentivize our coworkers to help fill in the gaps above and beyond their, their core hours in a consistent way and leveraging a technology in a centralized way that seamlessly speaks to the parameters that you set into your staffing and scheduling system, visualizing that clearly for our coworkers across the board to pick up those incentive shifts and then putting it back into your schedule so that way it's routinely updated and really removes that additional layer of work for your frontline leaders to manage, manage their staffing levels. And so it's more proactive rather than reactive staffing. And that is what we continuously uh, uh, are reiterating on this, but it, it's proven to be uh, quite a bit of success and very well received by not only our internal coworkers, but our leaders as well. I mean, they really enjoy being able to see what are my options and, and maybe I do want to pick up a higher dollar amount because I want to go on a trip in X amount of time. And it makes, it removes the guesswork of having to have those conversations with your leaders, negotiating that type of incentive, right? And they can shop around. They can shop around based off of whatever works for their schedule while benefiting um, uh, our patient care, right? Because we are getting people to the bedside of where we need it most. Can you speak to the timeline it took to roll this out in your across your health system and get everyone switched to the to do their scheduling in the system? Yeah, and so it's definitely an iterative pro uh, process, and I would say um, it, it'll take you anywhere from six to twelve months to really truly stabilize an implementation like this. And so there is some pre work that you need to do, and really it's again aligning the strategic focus and the structures in place 
to ensure that when you in turn on a technology like this, they're not at direct conflict. You're removing that structural tension that we often are faced with. And so ensuring that you have alignment um, uh, across the board and bringing people on in that way by ensuring that, again, from a staffing and scheduling perspective, you have consistent procedures in place that are being followed and adhered to by uh, across the board. And then the technology reinforces that, right? So there's no workarounds around the strategic direction to enable something like this. So there's the prep work of aligning that strategy and preparing your operational plan and implementation. And then there's a piece around um, sustainability. So you go live and it's gonna take you anywhere from four to 12 weeks to really stabilize that implementation of the system. Um, and it's really, again, focusing on ensuring that there is consistency across your staffing and schedule operations across the board. There are no workarounds um, that, that people can follow to really um, ensure that you get the outcomes that you need and keeping it consistent and continuously reinforcing that. Um, and so it's a, it's, it's a multi-timeline uh, multi, uh, approach and it all depends on where you are at for, in terms of organizational readiness into that. Um, but if you're more aggressive, you could easily do it within six months. If you need a little bit more time to um, align your systems and structures from an operational perspective, then it could take a, up to a year to do something like this. And at, I want to give Nita and the operational team a shout out. We have a whole playbook around this. So we have all the steps outlined, the change management, what should go first, second, third, um, and what you can expect, right? We've got learnings, FAQs documented. So um, if, you would if you would desire to go with um, our technology vendor that we work with, all that comes right along with it. So you wouldn't have to design all of that. You would get our learnings with it, guys. So. Mm -hmm. It, it's a, why why go through what we went through right um trying to learn and we did take we yeah. we took a couple hits right getting this up and running um uh, but but we're here to tell about it so and we have the results that uh pretty much nobody in the country coming out of the tam pandemic has today so it's been a huge help it also having that flexible workforce layer allowed us to be more aggressive with driving down our agency costs because we were less reliant on that more costly layer so we're able to play with our workforce layers. Um, depending on the, what the market gives us, we're able to play with how we increase fill rate. And that is so important because every market looks different. Even in our own health system, there are more people that have agency, there are more people that have gig, there are more people that have more stable core. And we're just playing with it to get the right mix, to get more hands by the bedside. Great. Well, I think we're coming up on our time, but does anyone have any last questions for our presenters today? I do want to offer, and I didn't want to bring them into the conversation, Trusted is our technology vendor. Um, if you are at all interested, happy to get you a live demo as well of watching somebody setting up staffing and scheduling, um, the Mercy works on demand product and then the app, so you can see how they're using, visualize it in a live demo. Um, Nita is most familiar with that, and she, I'm sure, would be happy to coordinate. So all you have to do is reach out if you're interested. Great, and uh, if we're able to share the slides with everyone, I know that would be great as well. Uh, so I just want to say thank you to our presenters uh, for joining us and for showing us your work and really thoughtful approach. This has been great. I think we have a lot to think through, but I'm happy to learn from what you all have implemented. And um, I think it's a great model. So thank you. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Safe travels. Thank you guys. Our pleasure. Appreciate you.